Hello, everybody. Welcome to the session Java, Kotlin, Concoverage, and their best friend, Bytecode. Uh, we will have today, during this session, a little bit of scandals, a little bit of intrigues, and a little bit of investigations. Uh, my name is Evgeny Mandrikov, and let's start. Of course, before we start, I should put my usual disclaimer that whatever I'm going to present to you today or tell is not opinion of my employer. My employer can only dream to own my opinion. Uh, nevertheless, I work in a great company. Uh, you might know them by products such as SonarCube, SonarLint, SonarCloud. And let me do a quick check. Who knows who uses those products? Yeah, okay. Quite some people. That's great. But today we're not going to talk about this company and the products of this company. We're going to talk about something uh, on what I work in my spare time, night time, etc. About Java code coverage. I'm one of project lead and maintainers of a library uh, which you might know, Jacoco. Let's check again who uses this tool library. Okay. Pretty good. So. While developing this library, we do test it on a quite big range of uh, GDK versions. Uh, nowadays, it's 16 and a half GDK versions. Why half? Also because we test early access builds, something that is not yet released. Uh, today, we are going to see why we do such a wide testing, uh, what it actually finds, etc., etc. Before we go there, let me do one more check. Which Java version do you use? So. Is there somebody who uses uh, Java 5 or below? I hope no, but, well, I do. Um, let's speed up a little bit, uh, skip some versions. Uh, GDK 8 and below. Okay, quite some people. 17. Okay, 21. Oh, the lucky ones. Okay, so why do we test uh, such a big range? Uh, well, sometimes uh, we do find bugs in GDK, actually, and one of the goal for us is to find those bugs. It's quite a funny process. We find them, we report them, even before GDK is released, so you get a bug-free GDK. Wonderful. Of course, sometimes we implement new feature in our library, um, and we're going to also see today why we implement uh, such a new features and what those new features are about. So as a, as a starter, here is an example. Uh, code coverage report of some code base using Java code coverage uh, Jacoco uh, version 081 some time ago looked like this. We implemented some new features, and without any changes in your code, in your proje project, the same report started to look like this. One looking on the first report might say, well, it was not well tested. But looking on the second report, well, it actually was. Why this happens, uh, what we implemented, this is exactly what we are going to see today. Um, so it's important to understand that Jacoco receives all, in, all information from the class files, not from your source files. It looks on the result of compilation of your class files. This is very important. Um, this actually nice thing. It allows to simplify integration into your build tools, into your projects, etc., because you don't need to integrate actually with the build process. You don't need to interleave with compilation. You can apply Jacoco on already compiled code. Um, if you would like to measure code coverage of some, some library uh, for which you don't have source files, it provides a nice feature. You don't need source files. You can still measure code coverage. Um, and uh, new syntactic sugar appearing in a language is not a problem for us because it's just a syntactic sugar in source files, in class files, nothing changes, so we can easily support such features. Among those features, for example, text block, which appeared in GDK 15, it doesn't change anything on the class files level. It changes only the source code. Well, there are some other jabs, like there is a draft of uh, concise method bodies. This won't be an issue for us to support. And initially, we saw that, uh, well, this actually opens a door for us, a quite big door, to provide a support for GVM languages other than Java, for example, Kotlin. Uh, well, this was partially true till some moment. Uh, nowadays, uh, there is some disadvantages of working with class files if you want to cover a language like a Kotlin, and this is also what we are going to see today. And now, the real disclaimer, before we really start. Sorry for this. There will be a little bit of blood out of GVM. 
There will be naked Kotlin compiler and Java compiler. Sorry for this. We are not going to use ID today. Uh, we're going to use, let's say, command line and invoke uh, compiler directly. Sorry for this. I'm going to use strong language. We're going to speak bytecode today. Uh, and sorry again for this. I will try to do intense violence of your brain within 40 minutes. If you're not ready for this, we can ask to open the door and you can still run away. Uh, if you all go, maybe I could visit some other wonderful session. Um, so, are you ready? Come on. Warm up. Yes, let's start. Let's start with Java. Let's start with something simple. Let's start with empty class. So, I have such a class. Its name, just by chance, bless me. And this class is empty. There is no methods inside. There is nothing inside. Is it empty? Do you agree? I think it is empty. Who thinks that this class is empty? It's empty, right? Let's have a look whether it's really empty. We're going to today compile our examples. We are going to use Java C. Java C bless me, we compile it. And what is, will be interesting for us is the result of compilation. What is inside class files? For this, we're going to use uh, another wonderful tool that comes together with GDK. You all have, have it if you have a GDK. It's, it's named Java P. So call it Java Disassembler. It doesn't actually provide you assembly. It provides you a bytecode, but well, historically it's called disassembly. We're going to use two options, minus V, verbose, and minus P, private, protected, etc. I call those two options basically show me everything. My favorite two options of Java, Java P, Java P minus V minus P. We supply the class name, and we see what's inside of this class file. Usually inside of this class file we can see check zoom from which source file it was compiled, we can see the major version, this class GDK version or Java version that cl this class file targets. For example, here I use it GDK 8 to compile for Java 8, so we see major version 52. There is also a constant pool. Constant pool is basically a long list of all constants that you use. It. Strings, method names, uh, attribute names, etc. Everything what follows uh, is going to reference the constant pool. So, Every link with other method or any name is going to reference the constant pool. This is the first and the last time you see the constant pool. It's quite huge. So on the next slides, I'm going to strip this out, but we know that it's there. So what's inside of an empty class? Actually, well, holy place is never empty. There is a constructor. If you go to the Java language specification, we do know that uh, uh, every class has to inherit from Java link object. Java link object has a constructor, so we should call the super constructor. So even our empty class is not empty. It contains a constructor with a super constructor invocation. And well, of course, every method cannot just fall uh, into void, into nothing. Any method should return. So there is also a return in the bait code. And here is a little link with the source. That's actually how Jacoco maps the bytecode back on the source. And what you see is a source, not the bytecode. We do this because in the class files, there is two important attributes. One attribute is line number table, which says, well, starting from this offset in the bytecode, this bytecode instruction corresponds to this source code line. Not a column, not a range, just one line. And uh, there is a source file name. Not the full path to the source file, just a source file name, not even including a package name or your directory structure, etc. Just a source file name. <coughs> Let's move on. Let's take an uh, example a little bit more complex. I hope you're starting to warm up. So what do we have here? We have an inner class. It's static. Uh, we have a private constructor inside of inner class. And this private constructor is called from an outer class. The first question is, is it valid to do like this in Java? Does this compile? OK, I know it was lunch time. You probably had a great uh, lunch, so you're a little bit sleepy. But the goal is to warm up, because uh, examples are going to be harder, harder, and harder. So, OK, we don't need to guess. We can just try to compile. If it doesn't compile, well, it's probably not valid, right? So let's try to compile, and the correct answer is, well, it compiles, all fine. Let's look inside. What happens inside? So again, I use Java 8. 
uh, here is a method where, where I call the private constructor. Uh, if we look carefully on it, what we are going to notice is that it actually passes a null argument to the constructor invocation. We can scroll back. Our constructor had no arguments, right? What's going on here? Let's look actually on the inner class. What happens in the inner class? We again decompile the inner class. Here is our private constructor. We could see the signature has no arguments. What, what, what's going on? If you look closer, we see another constructor. We didn't wrote this constructor. And this constructor actually accepts a parameter. If you look carefully, the constructor that we wrote, it is private. But the one there is not anymore. If you look on the type of argument that this constructor wants, yeah, it is package local. And we also could notice that it's uh, marked with a special attribute synthetic. Remember this word. If you look at the parameter of this constructor, yeah, OK, it invokes private constructor. It simply delegates. If you look on the parameter, we will see one more class that we didn't write. It also marked with a synthetic attribute. And this time, this class is really empty. This is the only way to get an empty class. You cannot create instances of this class. That's why in invocation of this constructor, there is no construction of an instance of this class. There is an argument. But why do we need this class at all? The answer is, while this code, let me scroll back, while this code is absolutely valid and correct from a Java language specification, it's absolutely perfect to call a private members of the classes written in the same source file, so in the nested inner classes, it's perfectly valid from the Java language specifications and point of view. But it is not from the Java virtual machine specification. For the Java virtual machine specification, those two classes, they're not at all connected. They lie one next to an, another. And you cannot call actually privates of another class. So, Long time ago, back in, I don't remember, probably 1.4, 1.6, uh, to work around this disruptancy, what developers of Java compiler decided to do, they decided to change a little bit uh, codes that you write during the compilation to overcome this problem so that GVM could see non-private constructor. And for this, they generate another one. And if it doesn't accept arguments, well, there is a clash. There is two constructors with, uh, with the same argument list. So they have to make them different. So they invented a marker which disambiguates one constructor from the other. That's a trick. Uh, let's scroll. All this, thankfully, changes. It has been a long time ago. In Java 11, there was a JEP 181, nest-based access control. If we take exactly the same example, use a more recent GDK version like uh, uh, the lucky of us can use GDK 21, if we compile the same source code, or even GDK 11, we are going to see the different pic picture. The inner class doesn't have any more the second constructor. It has only one constructor. It is private as we expect it to be. What changes is that there is a new attribute. The new attribute tells to GVM, don't worry. Don't worry, I am nested class of this outer class, so you don't need to obey ordinary ru uh, rules of calling privates. Because we are nested, it's OK if outer class calls my private constructor. Bam. I hope you start to get warm up. Um, let's take a little bit more complicated example. We have two classes, A and B. B extends A. So far, so, so good. We have two methods. One is declared in class A, object fun, it returns object. Another one is declared in class B, overrides original one, but returns string. Again, same question, is it possible to write like this in Java or not? Or I'm doing something stupid here? I'm pretty sure you all know the answer already. Uh, first of all, yes. Second, well, we can just compile and see, right? Um, to return types, it's, it's actually OK. This compiles. 
Let's see what happens in the bytecode. So this time I use more recent GDK version, 18, not 8. Uh, here is uh, in class B method which returns string. All good so far. We expected this method to be there. If I scroll further, we have again method fun, but this time signature difference. Return type differs. We didn't wrote this method in class B. There is no method in class B that returns object. It's again marked with this strange attribute synthetic. And we see one more attribute, which is called bridge. And this method simply calls original method that we wrote. Why so? What's going on here? Well, again, it's, it's a trick that uh, compiler developers has to do because of how Java Virtual Machine works. If we subclass some class A, there is probably code that accepts instances of class A. And this code, when calls method fun, expects return type to be object, not a string, object. So when we pass to this method a class B, the same code that, that accepts their class A still should work. And this code wants fun to return object. So compiler has to generate this function. And this co function called synthetic bridge. So what this is about, what this synthetic attribute is about, if we look at the Java virtual machine specification, we could find paragraph 478, which says a class member that does not appear in the source code must be marked using a synthetic attribute. This is very important. So everything what does not appear in the source code should be marked with attribute synthetic in the bytecode. And well, as in, as in any language, of course, like in French or German, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, there is exceptions. The only exceptions to these requirements, few methods uh, which are uh, default constructor. We already saw it, and we saw that it has no attribute synthetic. Indeed, we didn't wrote it in the source code. It appears in the bytecode, but it has no synthetic attribute. Class on interface initialization methods, uh, so static initialization, implicitly declare at members of enum and record classes. For example, for enums, we know those methods, it's value, values and value of. So why those generated methods are not marked with a synthetic attribute? You might ask. I'm going to tell you why. It's super simple. Synthetic members can only be accessed by a compiler. Only compiler can generate code which calls those methods. And now you probably start seeing a problem. If we will mark default constructor as generated as synthetic, you would never be able to in instantiate such a class. If you would mark generated methods of enums value of as synthetic, you would never be able to call them, which is not good. Why this is important for bytecode analysis tools? For example, why it is important for code coverage? Well, now you probably get this. If we do show in the report all these codes that you never wrote, you will be surprised at looking on the source code, and you will see exactly low numbers saying you didn't test something that you didn't wrote. So the logical conclusion out of this, well, code coverage tool should ignore synthetic methods, right? Why would you need to seize these implementation artifacts? You don't. We make such conclusion, and let's move forward. And as an example, we have Lambda starting from Java 8. So here is method that accept Ronable. Here is method fun. This method fun invokes another method that accepts Ronable, and as a Ronable, it passes Lambda as an argument. And let's notice that this Lambda prints a string joker, and this lambda is actually on a line number nine. Let's see what we get in the bytecode. So here is method exec. Everything is okay here. It accepts enable, no problem. Here is a method fun where we have a lambda. Where is joker? There is no string joker in this method. Where is line number nine? There is no line number nine. There is line eight and line 11. The nine that you see here actually corresponds to the bytecode of set, not the line number. 
Let's scroll further. Here is a new synthetically generated method that you never wrote in your source code. Its name starts from a magic word lambda, dollar. And here is a jacker inside of this method. And here is line number nine. This is implementation details behind lambdas. This implementation details, if you know about uh, invoke dynamic bytecode instruction, actually the body of lambda goes into separate method. At runtime from this method, uh, GVM is going to construct class representing this lambda. Why this is interesting? Why this is important? Well, because we already decided to ignore synthetic members. And we did so in Jaco version 071. If you do so, we are going to lose coverage for any lambda that you write. That's exactly what you could see, and that's exactly what happened to us. We need to fix this. So we write a special code that handles lambdas, which says, well, if the member is synthetic, but it doesn't start with a magic word lambda, only then filter it out. If it starts with a lambda, we still should keep it. Why it is again important? Because, well, for us, developers of Code Coverage tool, uh, there is a problem. There is no specification of this. It's implementation details. The name of a method could be different. It is actually different. Kotlin has a different name mangling na naming conventions. Scala has different name naming conventions. And actually, with Scala, it's quite funny. This naming convention changes over time. And we need to adapt to this. Let's move on. So at this moment, you might logically ask me, uh, that's it? You have only synthetic attribute and uh, a little bit of naming conventions or non-conventions, as we would say? No, actually, no. There is much more inside of Java compiler. Let's have a look at an uh, example of code that co contains finally block. The code is pretty simple. We have a try and we have a finally. Inside of try, we call function. Inside of finally, we call function. Simple, right? What we do expect to see in the bytecode? We probably expect to see two invocations of a function. But there is three. Let's count. Is there a free invocation of function knob? I could see three knobs on the slide. You too, I hope. One, two, three. But wait, the third one is a declaration. It couldn't appear in the bytecode uh, on the side of invocation. So what's, what's going on here? Let's investigate. Let's, let me help you a little bit. Let's add a string as a marker to know which exactly method and why we are calling. Let's, so in, inside of try, we are going to be passing string try. Inside of a finally, we are going to be passing string finally. Let's compile this, decompile. What changed? What's the difference? You could see. There is one try and two finally. Why? We had only one. What the hell is going on? Any ideas? There was no catch. Exactly. Ah, you warm it up. That's wonderful. Exactly. In the Java language, there is finally as a construction which says, well, you will arrive to finally, no matter what, whether exception happened or not, you will execute finally. And in the bytecode, there is actually no such construction. The only construction in the bytecode is so-called exception table. Exception table says it's not quite the same what try finally says. Exception table says, if exception happened on this range of bytecode instructions, then go to this bytecode instruction and execute code there. So with exception table, you can implement only part of finally. You can implement catch, but you cannot implement execution of finally on normal pass. That's a problem. To solve this problem, well, in case of exception, you execute exception handler, here it is. In case of, in absence of exception, in case of normal execution, you still need to execute the finally. So to solve this problem, compiler, simply copies the finally body inside of a try. Uh, 
It's also a problem for code coverage engine like Jokoko because normally people test one of those puzzles and it's pretty hard to test another one. They also might have a different uh, branches like uh, one of those branches and finally might uh, be executed only on exceptional paths but uh, the other one on normal. So it's, it's hard to test. So what we decide to implement is we actually do the job back. We find the duplicates and we merge them together. So if you tested uh, one set of branches on a normal pass, another set of branches on the exceptional pass, we merge them together and you get 100% coverage. Um, this is a funny example because now <coughs> you could try, for example, do many nested try finally. And you will quickly see, because of a code duplication, how fast the size of the class file, the size of the bytecode grows, because it's exponential. And if you do so, by the way, do it as a home exercise maybe, uh, you could find an answer on another interesting question, which is for how long you can copy. And the answer is just a little bit. It's not that a big number. You soon are going to reach GVM limitation on the size of the method. So now you know why you probably shouldn't put uh, try finally inside of try finally. It's not that great idea. A little bit of archaeology, uh, archaeology here. Uh, if you look at uh, GDK 1.4, I don't know if you can still get it, but I do have it. Uh, you could notice the difference if we compile the same source code. The difference is that in Java 1.4, this trick was not needed. In Java 1.4, you could simply do the same without duplication. How? Here is exception handler, and it uses a special instructions, GSR and RED. GSR is Java subroutine. So some time ago, quite a long time ago, Java had subroutines, a functions inside of a functions. But this become obsolete starting from Java 5 and uh, remove it in Java 6. You still can execute this bytecode, of course, backward-forward compatibility, but compiler doesn't generate such bytecode anymore. If you're interested why there were such instructions, well, there is an answer. This is related to bytecode verification. Uh, GVM needs to verify that uh, bytecode is valid. There is no holes in it. You cannot fall out of a method. Uh, you catch uh, exceptions, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and this is a pretty tough task. It turned out to be a pretty tough task if you have uh, Java subroutines. So, developers of compiler and GVM decided that well, we better kill subroutines that then we sacrifice bytecode verification because it directly connected to the security. And there is a great talk about this uh, by my friend Nikita Lipsky. You could find this talk and watch if you're interested. But let's move on. Let me complicate a little bit the uh, previous example of uh, try finally with uh, more modern construction, try with resources. I hope you know this one and you, you, are, you can use it in your projects. Um, this one is wonderful. If you have a resource that you use for some time and then you should close, you can implement closable interface, uh, define a close method in it, and uh, use, this in, uh, use this resource in try with resources method. And we know that Java is going to guarantee that once the, this try block finishes, uh, your close method is going to be executed. Your transactions are going to be committed, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Resources are going to be freed, and so on. What is behind this construction in the bytecode? Do you know? Well, we don't need to guess. We can again compile, decompile, and see by ourselves. Uh, it's a little bit too much probably to see in details. Let me zoom in. Does it help? Yes, it helps a little bit. We could see in the bytecode that the close method is called four times. Why so? Well, we know. Once the try block finishes, we should close the resource. In order to do so, let's call, it the, let's call the close method four times to be sure that resource is closed, right? That's probably what uh, compiler developers wanted to do. Of course not. Uh, there is a little bit more behind this. There is some branches. 
to understand the meaning of this byte code, we actually should go back to the Java language specification, and Java language specification gives us an answer. The meaning of a basic try with resources statement is given by the translation of the following try catch finally, and they provide this source code. It's also big, so let me uh, let me scroll a little bit. Here is a try catch. It catches exception. Uh, it remembers this exception. Here is a finally block. And in the finally block, there is quite some magic happening. If resource is not null, then only then we need to close it. Uh, in case of if exception happened, we need to close the resource, but we cannot just throw the exceptions that happens during the closing of the resource, because we already had another exception in fly. We need to attach one to the other. And well, if there was no exception, we can just call the close method and let uh, the exception thrown by close method propagate. That's the logic inside of uh, uh, try with resources. And we already know that such a finally block is going to be duplicated. And here we see two invocations of close, so in final result we're going to see four invocations of close. And this is a little bit uh, stupid thing, because there is a dead code. The resource cannot be null because uh, compiler knows actually that we just initialized this resource. It cannot be null. There is a dead code inside of uh, byte code of uh, try with resources. Uh, there is another dead code. On the exceptional pass, we know that exception happened. This branch on the, ex uh, on the exceptional pass can never happen. So there is another dead code. And of course, if we do provide, uh, uh, if we do provide uh, uh, code coverage report based on analysis of just this byte code to the users, Users will be wondering what they should do. There is no way to cover these branches. They're dead. So we need to filter this out. And that's what we do in Jekyll. Um Let me try to do one more thing, which I, let's say, promised you to do. Is this source code on a byte after compilation different from the try with resources or not? Let's give it a try. So, oops, let me go out. Java uh, C. We need try with resources. So here I have, uh, probably I should increase. One Java source file, try with resources. The one that I showed you on the slide. Let's look at the second source file. It contains this beast with try finally, etc. Let me select Java version 8. If I compile fun1 uh, and uh, I decompile it, and the name of this class is example, and I'm going to save the result in file1.txt, and if I do exactly the same but with fun2 and save result in to txt, what will be the difference between these two? We can see some difference. Of course, checksum is different. It's still a different class file. We could see uh, it's compiled from different source files. Of course, I had two source files. And the rest is only line numbers. There is no difference uh, in the actual bytecode instructions. The only difference is line numbers. So why this is interesting and why this is important for Jaco code? How we can distinguish one from the other? And the answer is we can't. So actually, to provide you a good code coverage report for try with resources, we implement some filtering logic that tries to find try with resources and hide this dead code, excluded from code coverage reports. But this byte code is exactly the same as if somebody would write such a source code. So if you would actually write such source code, give it to the Jekako, Jekako would say, well, there is no branches in it. We filter it out. Hopefully nobody writes uh, try with resources like this. It's quite complex code, so we are safe. It's OK to, to exclude it, etc. Um, 
the things I changed, by the way, uh, the previous example of compilation was done with Java 7. When Travis resources appeared, we noticed that there is a dead code. We provided a feedback to GDK developers, and the situation was improved. For exactly the same source code with Travis resources, they managed to remove uh, a little bit of a dead code. Instead of, two, uh, instead of four null checks, there is now two null checks. We again uh, gave them, uh, sorry, we again gave them feedback, and in Java version 11, they improved it even further. Here we see the uh, class file which was compiled with uh, GDK 11, but for Java 8. And uh, there was uh, two null checks. Now there is no null checks because uh, every, it is a dead code, so it's eliminated by compiler. That's type of bugs that we find in GDK. And well, how, here is how the report looks after we implemented a filter for Travis resources. Um, we don't have much time, so let me speed up, and I hope uh, you have warmed it up enough. Let's talk about Kotlin. Kotlin is wonderful. Uh, by the way, who is using Kotlin? Anybody? Okay, a few people using Kotlin. Kotlin has data classes. Java recently got records, but Kotlin for a quite, lo quite long time had data classes. So we have a data class. It declares a member, what's going to be in the bytecode. Kotlin is going to generate for us uh, uh, Getter method, uh, why it is not synthetic? It's generated. Well, the answer is the same. If it will be marked as synthetic, uh, you cannot call it. So it shouldn't be marked as synthetic, but why is this important for Jacoco? Because we need to filter this one out. Um, here is the setter, same problem, not synthetic, we need to filter it out. Here is a constructor, it's generated, not synthetic, we need to filter it out. Method to string gets generated, hash code, equals, they all has to be excluded, but uh, there is no synthetic attribute. What do we do? Thankfully, we got a help from Kotlin compilers. They told us that after generated method, normally they don't have line numbers. So everything that has no line numbers, we can filter out. But you see that uh, principles of filtering is uh, different depending on the source language. So our belief that uh, by analyzing byte code, we could actually cover the wide range of GVM languages was just destroyed by Kotlin and by Scala, by Groovy, etc. So for every specific case, we have to adapt our filters. Records, it's the same. Uh, we don't have that much time. In constructors, uh, uh, ah, yes, here is example why in records and why between languages it's different. I, for records, generated to string has no attribute synthetic, yet has line numbers. So we need to find one more strategy how to detect this best. And so on, so on, get a resetter. Um, let's look at this funny example of uh, Kotlin when uh, uh, by a string expression. In Java, we have the same. We can nowadays do switch by a string, right? So here, example is pretty simple. In a switch, we have three cases, right? One, two, three. What do we have in the bytecode? Here is a switch. And it has only two cases. One and two. Why so? Any ideas? Well, turns out uh, that it's much easier to implement switch or when by string based on the hash code. With a pretty high probability, if you take a hash code of a string, you already would know which case to take. So it's a very performant code. We take a hash code, and we jump to the case that, uh, that needed to be executed. In most of the cases, hash codes are distinct, so we immediately jump to the ones that we need to execute. Unfortunately, there is a, a hash code collision, so we still need to do a few comparisons to verify that, well, actually, we match it uh, what we expect in this case. And that's exactly what happened in this example. It turned out that two strings A and string B, they do have exactly the same hash code. So they fall into the same table switch case, and then we use series of if-else to decide which exactly it is. And if we analyze this byte code for code coverage purposes, we are going to see all of those branches. We are going to see switch and if checks. And users are going to wonder why there is uh, what? Uh, one, two, one, two, four, and two. Why there is six branches? In my switch, there was only three. Again, we need to implement filter for this. We need to determine 
not just on, on a method level, but like with try with resources, we need to determine that these bytecode instructions are actually originally uh, uh, switched by string. And we do so, we implement filter, and instead of six branches, you're going to see that, well, Jacoco is going to tell you, yeah, well, everything is OK. Don't worry. So in this code, there is only three branches. Um, funny fact, for the Kotlin, they have exactly the same problem. Developers of IDE and another code coverage tool for Kotlin, they face exactly the same difficulty. The developers of the language themselves they face the difficulty how to deal with this. Their code coverage tool, if you run it in a special tracing mode, which is show me all the branches, is going to say that this switch has branches that are not covered. Funny. Uh, we don't have that much time, uh, but we will try to speed up. In Java 12, we got switch expressions, right? You might be lucky to use them. What's wonderful with switch expressions? With switch expressions, if they are exhaustive, if they are done on sealed classes or on enums, and you list all possible cases, you don't need to write else branch. You don't need to. That's wonderful. Unfortunately, as like with uh, other disruptances between Java language specification and Java virtual machine, they, they not agree. For the Java virtual machine, you have to write this uh, default case. You have to. Why? Split compilation. What if you did a switch, and at the compilation time, you had two cases? You listed them all. All good. In source code, you don't need to write else branch. Now, at runtime, Somebody gives you a different enum that you had at the compilation time. And this enum now has three values because library evolved. At runtime, you have a different version of a library. What should happen at runtime? What do you expect to happen? You, sh you expect some signal that, uh, well, something is not working. The only signal is to throw exception. And that's what compiler does. It generates in the bytecode a default case that is going to throw incompatible class change here. Yes, uh, this code is not compatible with the new definition of the UNU. Again, we need to filter this out. Uh, let's move on. Today is 2023. We already got Java 11, Java 14, and we got other wonderful features like pattern matching instance of, right? Simple construction. If we have some object, we can do instance of in, in the if. Uh, check whether it's of a given type or not, and if it is inside of the if, we could use uh, already uh, value after the cast, right? How this translates to the bytecode? If you look at the, in the bytecode, and here I use Java 14 preview, where instance of pattern matching was not yet ready for prime time, it was a preview feature, we could see that there is a condition instance of. So far, so good. But there is another condition. Why two? Why not just one? Well, it turns out to implement instance of. And this was not written in Java language specification. For the try with resources, they wrote this in specification, so you can at least understand what's going on. But for instance, pat instance of pattern matching, they didn't write this in specification, but actual implementation was doing this. Turns out that in order to place cast and uh, variable inside of an if, you could simply translate instance of pattern matching as a such construction with the two conditions. And the second condition is again that code. There is no way it's going to evaluate to false because temp is equal to the temp always. It's exactly the same object. Again, uh, we provided the feedback and uh, they fixed it uh, before in Java, in Java 16 it's already fixed. Uh, there is only one condition. They do smarter. Um, Java 17. We got pattern matching in switch. Can you imagine what happens with this beast? Me neither. So what we should do, we compile, we decompile, we look. Pattern matching. Java 17 preview. 
here is a switch, all good, uh, condition of a first case, body of a first case. If there is no match, uh, they use a little bit of magic. Uh, they restart switch, but from another index, so that they can implement the conditions. It, it, good. it, it is good. It doesn't introduce any new branches. It doesn't affect us, so far so good. Uh, again, uh, invoke dynamic is used here to do such magic, pretty much like for lambdas. That's not interesting. What interesting is we look at the line number table, which matches this byte code back to the source code. And we, if we carefully look at this line number table, or even better, we just take a debugger and try stepping through this switch in the debugger, line by line. We're going to be surprised. We're going to see that the debugger shows us strange line numbers which we do not expect to be executed at the moment when we expect. The mistake that was there is they screwed up line number table. We provided the feedback. They fixed it. And this time, we was faster than with instance of, uh, not after the release. We directly made the feedback on the pull request that was introducing switch expressions. It takes a little bit of our time. Um, we don't have a time for real hardcore to look at into it deeply, but let's try to do a little glance at it. Suspending functions. If you write in Kotlin, that, then you know that they have a wonderful feature, coroutines. Uh, structured concurrency. You write a code like it is not concurrent. It looks like a not concurrent code. But at runtime, it's going to be a highly concurrent code. In order to do all of this, there is a suspension point where your function can be stopped and execution can be transferred to some other function. In the source code, it looks wonderful. It looks nice. It looks readable. But probably you already can expect at which cost it comes when we look at the byte code. It's a beast. It's much bigger beast than try with resources. If you look inside, here is the method. It's, it's big. We had just five lines. But now it's, I don't know how many byte code instructions. 200 probably of sets there. There is a signature. Signature get transformed. There is a new parameter. Uh, there is some uh, branches. There is a new class uh, generated. This class contains some fields generated. It contains some methods that uh, calls our original method. Uh, if you look back at the original method, there is a big block to initialize all this. Uh, there is a, a table switch switch by uh, suspension points in order to restart some certain point execution of this method. We need to do this switch. Of course, before the suspension point, we ha and there is a point after suspension point, after we should restore the state, before we should save the state. And state is, well, we should store the local variables, we should save parameters, we should restore parameters. Here is a suspension point. Suspension point contains some additional branches. If uh, we are lucky enough and we can immediately uh, continue execution without a suspension, then let's just do it. And that's what is encoded here. But you can imagine if we, if we again give such a byte code to the byte code analysis tool like a Jokoko, it's going to say, oh, come on, there is hundreds of branches in it. Test all of them. But you don't need to. You can just trust the compiler. It does its job translating this source code into the correct byte code. So we developers of a such byte code tool should uh, should adopt, we again implement some filter. Um, I'm going to skip probably this last example, but you can already guess. Uh, in the Kotlin, there is inline functions that, that get inlined into the call sites. Uh, if you have such inline function, the body of this function is actually going to be inside of the call site. If you look at the byte code, yes, here is a call site, here is a first copy, and here is a second copy. And this one is ultimately hard to filter out because it's not exact copy. Compiler also did optimization in the first copy. Uh, there was two. There was two bran uh, There was two branches. One branch contains true. Another bar branch contains string false. If you look at the, sorry. If you look at the first copy, there is no branches. There is only branch true. If you look at the second copy, there is no true branch. There is only false. This very tough task for us to solve it. We cannot map this inline byte code back on the place where it was. 
So unfortunately, we have these uh, tickets still open for many, many years. We are discussing with Scotland compiler developers what can we do. We are trying to imagine what can we do, but it's, it's, it's not easy. So, conclusion. What is going to be executed is not source code. Be careful. You should know this. You write the source code, but what is going to be executed is not source code. What is going to be executed is some bad code, result of translation of your source code by compiler into some other code. Be careful, there is bugs as we've seen. This translation might be incorrect. You, as, as a users of GDK, as a users of language, would probably never step on such bugs. And this is good for you. Thanks to us, we catch such cases. Um, be careful, not even bytecode is going to be executed. You know there, there is another translator, just in time compiler in GVM. It's going to come and translate bytecode into machine native code. Be careful, there is bugs as well. Hopefully, you're not going to face them. Again, there are some other developers who take care of this, who are fixing these bugs for you. Um, be careful, bytecode-based tools such as Jacoco, such as uh, why not findbugs, handbugs, what else you could know. All bytecode analysis tools which do not look at the source code but look at the bytecode, unfortunately, sometimes the only choice for them is to make a best guess. As we've seen with try with resources, we just flip a coin and we hope that user actually wrote uh, try with resources, but not this big beast. Uh, and because of all this, it's actually quite hard for us to manage this. We have to adopt, as we've seen, uh, our filters to different language versions, to different compilers, to different compiler versions. And this is actually not a solvable task. There is no way to prove that uh, uh, two source codes or two byte codes or two byte codes uh, they are identical, they are equivalent. This is proven that this task is not solvable. So we just do our best to adapt. You have to put up with this as our users and live with it. And if there is only one thing that you can take out of this presentation, I wish it would be this one. As it is a very hard task, and you as a developer, you know what you face usually when you face your users, you only hear about bugs, right? Something is not working in your software. You probably never hear how wonderful your software is. When user is happy, user is happy. He never comes to you, right? The same happens to us, to open source maintainers, developers, etc. We only face with your angriness when you see in the report what you don't expect to see. You're angry and you come and say, well, it doesn't work. We know. We're going to do our best to fix this for you. But angriness is not motivating us to do this job. So please, if you have some favorite open source project and a little bit of your free time, please come to this project. And I'm not asking even for money. Just come to them and say, thank you for this too. I know it's not perfect, but sometimes it helps me. And this is motivating. Thank you very much, and thank you for your attention. We probably don't have time for questions, or we do. Anyway, you can ask them here or catch me outside. Okay. Well, first of all, thank you for Jacoco, of course. Um, the question I have is, uh, are you guys also like in communication with JVM developers about how to make this whole thing easier on the longer term, like introduce what, new ways of linking the source code to the bytecode? We, in terms of, uh, let's say, me and another Jacoco maintainer, the answer is, uh, would be no, for the reason that there is a history. There was already such attempts. 
and uh, they were not successful, so we don't have, let's say, time or courage or energy to resurrect those attempts. It's not an easy task, uh, actually. Uh, it's not uh, that easy problem, because the amount of information that you need in order to perfectly map uh, bytecode back to the source code is basically... Uh, you need a source code. You, you need a huge amount of information. You need all the columns, all the lines, etc. If we store this uh, in the bytecode, it's going to significantly grow uh, the size of the class files. That's one of the problems. Um, yeah, and what for? Only for, cover, for code coverage tools? There is, uh, there's probably so far no other use cases. And so GVM developers, GDK developers, they are not uh, so eager to, to maintain this complexity and this amount of uh, information just for the code coverage tools. It's, it's not a priority for them. They are not uh, providing you code coverage tools. You know, GDK doesn't ship with code coverage tool, unfortunately. But there were some attempts. Uh, in fact, even maybe last year, uh, JetBrains uh, tried to resurrect the subject. Uh, Tagir Valeev, if you might know, tried to, to move this a little bit, but as far as I know, also with no success. Some other questions? Okay, we should yeah. stop here. Thank you again. Enjoy the rest of the day.